Good evening, everybody. It's time for another exciting edition of Tool Shed Tuesdays. This is the episodes where I just sit and talk a little bit of smack, talk about our life out here, talk about the importance of a few things. And uh, tonight I want to talk about the importance of uh, good neighbors and good friends. Um, had something happen today. Okay, so out where we're at, we're pretty remote. <laughs> and we've got three neighbors. And out of those three neighbors, only one of them's full-time, and he's about two miles away. And the others are, let's see, 3.2, and then, let's see, 2.6 miles away. So one of the guys uh, popped in just the other night, and he's a federal surveyor up here in Alaska. So he goes on huge surveying projects. He's actually the guy who walks around with that $30,000 unit on, the back, on his back and just marks trails for miles. He sections off huge tracts of land. So anyway, he popped in the other night to his house. And then uh, while I was crawling around into the house the other day, he showed up. You know, we chatted for a while and we said we'd get together for dinner and whatnot. And uh, there are two property corners that I have. I have 40 acres here. And there's two property corners where we had found two bearing trees. There's always three bearing trees. We found two bearing trees on two of the corners, but we couldn't find the third, and we couldn't find the actual post in the ground with my uh, property designation on it. <laughs> so this guy was like, yeah, you know what, I'll stop by tomorrow. And I was like, yeah, absolutely. So he shows up today around probably 1.30, and he shows up with his gear, not his big rig, but just some handheld gear, and... We've got five and a half, six feet of snow out here, drifting around out in the woods. And none of this trail back in here has been broken. I mean, none of it. There's trees down, there's, yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty rough. So he comes over on his skidoo, old 2003 Bombardier wide track, 24 inch wide track. It was a Rotax 600 engine, I believe. So anyway, he comes scooting over, he's got his gear with him, and he's like, you ready? You know, saddle up. So I put my snowshoes on, and he goes tearing off through the woods. So he looks at my plat, he punches in some coordinates, and he goes tearing off through the woods, and I go snowshoeing back behind him. And within the first, I think, probably six minutes, we were at my first property corner, <coughs> which had the issue on it. And we found, the we found two bearing trees immediately, and then we located the third one. He, he was real good with this. He started reading the, uh, the distance and the bearing from all of it, northeast, south, and west. And sure enough, we found that third bearing tree, no problem. And then once we did that, we calculated to the center of those three bearing trees, and he started sticking a rod in the ground. Um, it was a, a metal detector. And sure enough, it started pinging like you wouldn't believe. We dug a hole down, and sure enough, there was my property corner. Now, I've seen my property corners before, but I hadn't found all the bearing trees. So I went and remarked all three of the bearing trees with uh, the tape. And then sure enough, as soon as we got those three bearing trees marked, he goes tearing down the long stretch of my property, and I'm snowshoeing behind him. And the long stretch of my property starts climbing the hills. So we go from about, I'd say, six, seven feet of elevation all the way up to about 110. And once we got up there, oh man, we saw Denali, Mount Foraker, you could see Mount Yinlo, Shell Hills. Unbelievable views of it, you know, on the back of my property looking out. Just the back corner of it though. The rest of the property is pretty flat. Only one back corner of mine goes up. Sure enough, he climbs this hill my machine would never have made it. It would have dove off. It would have been buried and just stuck until the summertime. It just goes piling up there. And I, and I come ten minutes behind him, trekking up there on my snowshoes. He's already plodding into the ground because he had already seen one of my bearing trees that I had marked. We found the other two. No problem. I marked those. He goes prodding in the ground. Sure enough, it starts going off. And we marked it. Unbelievable. But this guy didn't have to do this. You know, he comes up here to work on his cabin and do things for himself as well. But for him to just lend his time and his expertise, he does this for a living. So for him to do this for me, it's almost like him going to work. 
So I was extremely appreciative for that. Hold on a second. Been a long day, boys. So we get back here, and we try to offer him coffee, all that other good stuff. He's like, no, I need to get back to my cabin, do some work. Shook the guy's hand, and just unbelievable generosity, you know, that he would just lend himself like that. And like I said, he's got 3,000 things to do over at his, his place, rather than come over here and do his job helping me find a couple of my bearing trees. But, so we owe that guy a couple favors, there's no doubt about it. But it's one of the things out here is when you're definitely remote, or even if you're rural, a country, whatever you want to call it, you know, <laughs> you know your neighbors. How many of you guys live in suburbs where you know your neighbors, but when's the last time you've eaten dinner with them or invited them over for a barbecue or talked to them and just see how their life is going? People really don't even know their neighbors anymore. And it just seems that when you start getting in the rural country, when you start getting remote, off-grid, that your neighbors want to know who you are. They want to know kind of what's going on over there. What kind of a person are you? Can we count on you if something bad happens? Worst case scenario, can we ask a favor of you? You know, it's just, it's good to know your neighbors. You don't have to like them, but you do have to respect them. You know, and, and vice versa. That, that street is a two-way street. Because there may be one day where you go screaming for help and that neighbor you don't like doesn't like you, but he'll come running because he respects you, because he knows you, and because he's your neighbor. And so, I, you know, in that vein, I was just thinking about it. When we were in the suburbs, it was just crazy. All these people we lived next to, there was 40, 50 houses within, you know, row houses. We never spent time with any of them. Never even bothered to do anything more than a wave. Hey, how you doing? As they drive by or, you know, well, we're checking the mail or something. You see the same people, but you don't know who they are. And I just think it's kind of sad because there is this disconnect in society where you just don't know the people you live around. And those are exactly the people you should know. Because if you know everybody that lives around you, when somebody new comes into the area, well, it's just a safety precaution. Somebody saw something. So if something were to happen, somebody can at least say, oh, that moving truck in your driveway wasn't you? And they can at least give the police, you know, description of something. Anyway, it's just the, the importance of getting to know the people that are around you. And it just seems like in the suburbs, that just doesn't happen anymore. Everybody just bottles themselves up. They go to work, miserable cycle. You come home, you shut the door, you crack a beer or whatever it is you do. And you just stick, stick to yourself, stick to your own. But another thing, another neighbor, another story, and this was just the other day. So the full-time neighbor we have over here, he's an elderly gentleman, so we go visit him every now and then. So just to check on him, see how he's doing. Um, as a matter of fact, a couple days ago, I went and helped him completely just drop a huge birch tree. I mean, a mammoth birch tree. Boom, crashed it down, bucked it all up into uh, pieces. And he's got really bad COPD. He can't breathe. He can't walk 15 feet without doubling over. So I kind of knew it was all going to be on me. But that's fine, you know. I help that guy, he helps me. We leave out of here, he watches the property. He looks for new tracks coming in and out. Now, the one thing about this piece of property back here and as for a matter of fact, this whole little region, I would say, is we all know each other. And the only way you're going to come back in here is, A, if you are just absolutely lost. You, <clears throat> you are a hunter, and you just happen to stumble upon my cabin. That's the only way you're finding this place. Or, you see my snow machine trail all the way up into the major river system. And if somebody takes that, that trail from the river system back to this problem, there's a problem. We've got a real problem. I better know who the hell you are. But the good thing about this is, is this trail runs right through the front yard, literally, of one of our neighbors. You cannot get back here 
without somebody knowing, somebody hearing, somebody seeing. And on a number of occasions, those people have actually chased down somebody and basically said, hey, who the hell are you and what the hell are you doing back here? And there's only two other people back here, three people back here. So unless that person that's coming back here spits off a name or something, those neighbors, they're cocking a gun. Turn it around and get your butt out. So it's kind of everybody's looking out for each other. So it's also a safety issue. And I would say this, though. There's no way somebody is just going to punch a trail back into here. First, you'd have to know where you're going. If not, you would just, you're in no man's land. Second of all, if you're on that trail, our neighbors are going to see you. They're going to hear you, and they're coming. So it's just one of those things, guys. Well, look, I don't want to make this video too long-winded because I do have a little project here on the table next beside me that I need to get going. And I think I'll show you guys that. And I'm pretty sure most of you have actually been through this before. So I'm going to move the camera here in a second. It's going to get shaky for a second. But I'll show you, <coughs> I'll show you what I'm talking about. I'm living the high life, boys. All right. Here we go. Everybody has an axe, everybody has a splitting mall. This is no different. In some of my other videos, you guys have probably seen me using this. So here's the deal. Everybody has hit has had overstrikes before. Now there is a rubber gasket on here. That comes standard. Once you beat the hell out of that, I took a bunch of uh, duct tape, wrapped it around a bunch just to give it that little extra. And um I guess, you know, after a while, you start overstriking still, and you tear that up. So, let me see if this is coming out. I think we all get the gist right there. So, all my overstrikes. So now, guys, I think it's time to take off this rubber piece. This rubber piece off. There ain't no popping to it, it's on there. <laughs> Alright, guys, I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna stop this video for a second, go ahead and get this off, and then uh, from there we'll go. Alright, guys, as you can see, I just got off all this uh, tape and this rubber. Boy, that stuff was on there pretty good. Had to use a, uh, an X-Acto knife. And uh, here's what my thinking is anyway. So now that I have no protection, I've got this, I have a half a uh, hide. Well, I had half a hide of cow leather. Um, and every now and then I'll do some leather work. I'll make pouches. I'll make... Um, sheaths for my chisels, things of that nature. So anyway, it's always good to have around. But, so I had a half a height of that. And what I did is I squared out a piece. And what I'm thinking about doing is wrapping it on there. And the only way I know to uh, adhere that to this right now is I can look around maybe find something else. But I'm going to use this Gorilla Glue. I'm sure everybody's familiar with Gorilla Glue. Sorry. Oh, so we got the Gorilla Glue going, guys. Can we have Gorilla Glue? That would work for my finger. Yeah, we can Gorilla Glue your finger, darling. So, um, here's what I'm thinking. Just apply a little bit of this, wrap this on here, and uh, see how this holds. 
And like I said, this is always caused by overstriking. Now, if I smash this, if I break this head off, yeah, I can go into the woods, no problem. And I could easily... I can go into the woods, no problem. And without... And get... Um, and make another handle for it. But what I think I'm going to do is try to preserve the one that's on there, obviously, as long as I can. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this on here. And uh, let's see how this goes. So. But I'm really curious to see exactly how this adheres. If it'll adhere to this plastic. And I did leave a little bit of it on there so it can kind of grab something. So about to find out. But I think first, probably want to roll this. Kind of give it that tucked feel. Okay. So, let's see how this would best fit. I don't want it overlapping. I want it overlapping with anything on the front. Which means I have to start there and end here. Okay. So with that being said, let's do it. And by the way, this is no endorsement whatsoever for Gorilla Glue. If this fails miserably, that's all on me, guys. Actually, I'll blame Teresa. You did it, darling. Boy, this stuff sure is thick, though. Okay, let's not go stupid with it. So either it bonds and here adheres or it doesn't. So I tell you what, in a later video, I'll let you guys know how this uh, actually hangs out, how it actually works. So, with that being said, let's go back under here. Let's swing that around. And this is about to get messy. Real question is, is will this adhere? Well, it's adhering so far. That's actually a really good sign, guys. But just to make sure, let's go ahead and strap this thing down. And I'll let you guys know how that works out. There we go. Do I have another clamp? Of course I don't. The camera's running. All right, guys. So I'm gonna let you how I'll let you guys know how this works out. Uh, thanks for uh, tuning in, watching these. Uh, Teresa and I really appreciate all of them. Another thing is we just hit a big milestone uh, just recently: 500 subscribers on YouTube. We're huge now, boys. Watch out. We're pushing big weight. We appreciate all 500 of you more than you know. And we get the biggest kick out of reading all of your comments and responding to as many as we can when we can. Guys, you have to understand, we do not have mobile uplink satellite capabilities here yet. We are working on a mobile boost system. When that happens, then we can start communicating with you guys on a regular basis. Now, the only time we can upload a video or receive data transmissions 
is when we go to a lodge that's about 23 miles away. So that's generally where we do all our uploads. So thank you guys for everything. Thank you for all the likes, the comments, and just please keep them coming. If there's anything you guys would like to know about what we do out here, how we do it, within reason, you know, we still would like to stay pretty private. But we love to interact with you guys. So like, subscribe, and uh, shoot us some comments down below. If you have, I've seen other videos where guys have put metal on here before. Sorry, I don't have any metal or tin on me just yet. So, if you guys have ever had this overstrike problem, tell me what you've used to fix it. Or what your solution was. Would love to hear it. Alright guys, signing off from the bush of Alaska. Have a great day. Treat each other with respect. And keep your boots dry.